Dr. Tversky once told me, Dr. Tversky Olav HaSholem once told me, he says, Rabbi, why, why? Let me tell you something. I have 60 years of experience. He told this to me in Boca. 60 years of experience has taught me that the addicts among us are the most spiritual among us. And they couldn't numb their pain with Rogalach and Jalapeno Herring and Yerushalmi Kugel, like some of us. So they went to alcohol, to drugs. They destroyed themselves. You know why? Because their void was deeper, because their spirituality was deeper. The Yeshiva.net. Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much. I think I graced this shul, Yutas Kislev, 10 years ago. I think some of you were there. So I'm really thrilled and honored. Thank you, Rabbi and Rebbe and Canterman, for bringing us together. Oh, wow, there's a whole crowd up there. Okay, welcome. For bringing us together on this auspicious evening of Yutas Kislev, Chav Kislev. And thank you, everybody for gracing us with your beautiful presence. Thank you, for Rabbi Kay, for your very moving words about your son of blessed memory. May he be an eternal source of light, confidence, and inspiration to you, the family, all of the Jewish people in Israel and the whole world. There's an old anecdote about a couple in New York that didn't have children for many years and a great Kabbalist came for a visit from Israel and they went to visit him and they asked him if he could pray for them to be blessed with a child and he said of course and he asked the father the husband and the wife to write their names and their mother's name on a piece of paper and he said he's going tonight back to Israel tomorrow he'll be at the Western Wall and he'll put the note into the wall and pray to Hashem that they have children. Great. He comes back for a visit five years later. And he's walking in the street, and he sees the woman whom he met a few years ago. And he says, hi, how are you? How are you? And he looks at her and he says, has there been good news? She says, yeah, we have ten children. He says, what? She says, ten children, we have a minion. We don't have to go to shul anymore. We have a minion. The rabbi says, that was fast. How did that happen? She said, well, the first year we had triplets. The second year I gave birth to twins. I decided I needed a break, so I took a break for a year. The next year I had twins. The next year I had triplets. The rabbi is like, wow. Shechiyonu v'kimonu v'giyonu l'zmanazeh. Mazal tov, mazal tov, hoidul Hashem kitoif. Where's your husband? I want to give him the biggest kiss and hug in the world. She says, my husband went to Israel. He says, that's so nice. What's in Israel? He went to Jerusalem. Why? He went to the Kaisa, to the Kotel. Why? He's looking for the note. He wants to take it out. I think it was Mark Twain who said, when I was nine, my father was brilliant. When I was 19, he was a fool. Now I'm 29 and I have a couple of kids and he has a lot of wisdom to share. It's funny how much the old man learned in 10 years. We live in a generation where everyone has a lot to say about the youth. Everyone has an opinion. The opinion is often very negative, entitled. You ever heard that word? They're so entitled. I get emails every day. My kids are so entitled. Another email. What happened to Kibbut of Aim? They don't respect anymore. I respected my mother through thick and thin. She writes to me, you think it was easy? You know my mother? But my kids just don't have the same ethic. Spoiled, addicted, of course, <coughs> obnoxious, narcissistic, selfish. 
self-indulgent, <laughs> talk too much about their feelings, what happened with being a soldier, put one foot ahead of another foot and forge forward like your parents and ancestors did for the last 15.3 billion years, I mean for the last 5,783 years. <clears throat> <coughs> people have a lot of opinions about a young generation they're worried they're concerned it's a very powerful conversation and I think that Yutas Kislev provides a very potent relevant insightful not just reactive approach but a visionary proactive approach to understanding what they would call this sugya, this conversation, this aspect of Jewish life today <coughs> and more importantly tomorrow. There's a Mishnah in Pirkei Avis, everybody knows the ethics of the fathers, chapter five, that there were 10 generations from Adam till Nayach. And the Torah enumerates the 10 generations, the names, of those ten generations, Lahidiya, to tell you how much patience God has. Shakal Hadiris Hayamachisin Uboyin. All the generations were digressing, deteriorating morally, becoming worse and worse and worse and worse. Until finally Noyach's generation came and everything plotzed and the earth vomited its inhabitants and the flood came. And then there's another ten generations from Noach to Avram, to tell you how patient God was, that all these generations continue to decline morally. Until Avram came and he received the reward of all of them. And the commentators ask a very powerful question. It doesn't make sense. You say, from Adam to Noach, the generations were becoming worse and worse until the generation of Noach, they were destroyed. Then you say, from Noach till Avram, the generations were becoming worse and worse, until Avram came and he received the reward for everybody. Which reward, if they were becoming worse and worse? It doesn't say Noach received the reward for everybody, because there was no reward. There was a flood. So if it was, say, from Noach till Avram, they were doing good and doing better and better, and Avram got, and he reaped the reward, I understand. But it says, Machis in Uboyin, just like the first time. They were morally declining, and then Avram Avinu came and he received everybody's reward. Where was their reward, and why the difference between him and Nayach? We'll get back to it in a few moments. Be'ezer Hashem Neder. The Gemara says at the end of the Mishnah says at the end of Maseches Saita, the signs of Ikvus Mashiach, the signs before Mashiach comes. One of them is Yirei Chait Imasu. Those who fear sin will be scorned. People will look down at them. Yimasu, they will be treated as something like repulsive. People will be allergic, allergic to yirei hate. It will be like disgusting in people's eyes. Oh, you fear sin? On a literal level, it means there comes a time in history when people lose their moral compass and anybody who has yirei shemayim, somebody who has fear of heaven, seems like a strange, archaic person. Yimasu, you're like a weirdo. You belong to a different generation. That's one interpretation. But the seer of Lublin, the Chayza of Lublin, the great master, <coughs> Rabbi Yaakov Yosef Horowitz, who was one of the great students of the Magad of Mizrich, whose yard site was commemorated today, the 250th yard site of the great Magad of Mizrich, Rabbi Nudayv Ber, passed away, Yutes Kislev, 1772, Tovkov Lamad Gimel, so 2022 is exactly 250 years since the yard site of the Magad of Mizrich. And one of his students, the seer of Lublin, writes, that I heard from my friend Reb Zusha. Reb Zusha of Anapoli was a friend of the Seer of Lublin and another student of the Magad of Mizrich. And Reb Zusha said that the meaning in the mission is very different. Yirei who doesn't mean they will be disgusted with people who fear sin because of the lowliness of the generation. But in a classic Hasidic spin and twist and in a classic expression of the graciousness and deep humility and holiness of Rabbi Zusha of Anapali, he said, it means something else. Before Mashiach comes, fear of sin 
will be looked down at because the Jewish people will be craving a relationship based on love, not based on fear. So the paradigm of serving God exclusively out of fear, out of dread, with a sense of anxiety or a sense of pressure, I'm afraid, yimasu, they will look down at it. It will be scorned. It will be seen as, really? Cheat, cheap. Why? This is what he says. Shamati mi Rebzusha. I heard from Rebzusha. Because they're going to be craving a relationship of ava, of, of deep attachment, of love, of affection. I think we understand what that means. If you'll ask, <coughs> if you'll ask somebody, why should... Why do you think you should invest in your marriage? Why should you make your marriage a better marriage? And a husband or the wife says, well, <laughs> I'm afraid. The husband says, I'm frightened for my wife. If I don't behave nicely, who knows what she's going to put into the cholent? <laughs> who knows? Yeah. Who knows what the house is going to look like? Who knows how I'll be treated? Who knows how I'll be punished and penalized? It's going to be Gehenim. That's why, you're, that's why you're in therapy? Yeah, there's no other reason. I'm just frightened. I'm just frightened of the consequences. It's like, what do you do? You shrug your shoulders. And like, <laughs> nebach. The greatest motivation for a good relationship is the relationship itself. I want a relationship that's not based on fear and dread and anxiety but a relationship that's based on the beauty of attachment, on the depth of connection. I want to be connected. The greatest reward for a good relationship is a good relationship. <laughs> the greatest reward for a good marriage is the marriage itself, nothing else, that the food is going to be better. That's the greatest reward. So there comes a time in Judaism when the Jewish people say, I don't want a relationship with God simply because he's bigger and stronger than me. My tati is stronger than your tati. And he could punish me. And the fires in purgatory are going to be very powerful and intense. Or I'm simply afraid of consequences in this world and the next world. I mean, if it stops you from doing something terrible, go ahead, you know. But to define Judaism on that foundation... Yimas, or the Bzusha says, there comes a time when people say, I'm not, I'm not enthusiastic about it. I need a deeper connection. I need an emotional connection. I need to be able to feel the love. I need to be able to feel that this helps me dance and celebrate life. It allows me to actualize my potential. It allows me to touch the heavens. It allows me to touch my essence. It allows me to suck the marrow out of life and live life to the fullest, physically, emotionally, psychologically, spiritually. I need to feel the love. I need to feel the ecstasy. I need to feel the internal, intimate connection based on positivity, based on attachment, not based on fear. Why right before Mashiach comes? And the answer is, because the definition of Geula, the definition of redemption is Yichud, Oneness. Oneness between heaven and earth. Oneness between soul and body. Oneness between the animal consciousness and the divine consciousness. Oneness within humanity. Oneness within the Jewish people. Oneness of the cosmos and the universe. And oneness between creator and creation. And a relationship that's based on oneness is always motivated by the desire to be close, not by the fear of being distant, not by the fear of the penalties for being distant. It's created by the passion of how beautiful We say every morning before davening, the children of Avram, who you gave a note, Zera Yitzhak Yechide Adas Yaakov Bin Chab Cherecha, Shemehavoscha Sha Hafta Oisoi, Umisim Choscha Shesamachta Boy, Karosa Shmo Yisrael Vishuru. 
the part of davening a lot of people skip. So don't worry if it doesn't ring a bell. I know you're doing it for 60 years, but it's fine. Don't worry. Don't take it personal. <coughs> That's when your ADD usually kicks in. You know that page? It's like, you're done. You know, call me by Ovalitsian. But the words are very rich because of the love that you loved him and the joy that you rejoiced in him. You celebrated his existence. And you gave him that name, Yisrael. Lefichach. Therefore, I want to be in a relationship with you. And then we say, Ashreinu matayv chalkeinu, how fortunate we are. So there is a gullus relationship and there's a geula relationship. An exile-like relationship is a relationship that still has a lot of toxicity. It has a lot of trauma. It has a lot of pressure. A lot of parts of me are not involved. That's what exile means. Exile means parts of my soul. As the Alter Rebbe always says, parts of my soul are locked away. Parts of my soul are not present in the relationship. So yes, fear becomes a very motivating factor. But in a relationship of gula, of achtos, of unity, all of me is present in the relationship. How can all of me be present in a relationship? Only when all of my emotions are fully present. Every nerve in my nervous system, every fiber in my being, every cord in my heart, and every neuron in my brain celebrates the relationship. Wow, what does this mean? What happens? How do you prepare for such a relationship? First thing is, you have to get in touch with your emotions. You have to know what you're feeling. You have to know what you're experiencing. If I repress my feelings, if I don't know what I'm feeling, which some of us are very good at, not knowing what you're feeling, you may be married to such a person. In other words, it's not intentional, I'm just clueless, right? Much easier to eat kugel than to feel emotions. Much easier. It's also healthier. It's also cheaper. You have to go to therapy for kugel. If you feel your emotions, you may have to pay a therapist. If you eat kugel, you're good. So you kill 20 birds with one stone. You numb your emotions. Your taste buds are happy. Yeah? You add something to your fat reserve. Right? It's beautiful. So that's one way of dealing with it. But there's no way I can graduate, I can evolve from Yirei Chet, from a fear-based relationship to a love-based relationship if I don't ask myself, what am I afraid of? What do I want? What do I need? What do I yearn for? That's what's happening in our generation. Not everybody is comfortable with it. I happen to be, you'll forgive me, don't stone me, I happen to be a big fan of our generation. Not because of some blind faith, because I know the youth, I deal with them every day. They're the most precious of the precious, the most authentic of authentic most real of MMS, pure, idealistic. They just don't want to bury hypocrisy anymore. It used to be, everyone used to have a wall-to-wall -wall carpet, you remember? Why? The answer is everything had to go under the carpet. So when you have a carpet wall-to-wall, -wall, there's enough place to put everything under. Today the new style is tear out the carpet, bring it up, emerge. On Pesach, we hide the Afikaiman under the couch, and then by tzafun, the children find the Afikaiman, and they want, it used to be a Parker pen or a calculator, today it's a private plane, private yacht, whatever it is, <laughs> at least a tablet. If you give them potato chips for the Afikaiman like we got, they'll call child services on you. <laughs> Such a level of abuse, Parker pen, a Parker pen for, used to be the Rockefellers got a Parker pen for the Afikaiman, and the Schnurrers got potato chips. And if you were like middle class, you know, right, your, your father owned a station wagon, so you got like a black and white, or maybe, maybe, you know, a calculator. What's the meaning of that custom? Open your hearts. The meaning of the custom is, as we celebrate the night of freedom, tradition tells us, whatever you're going to hide, your children are going to expose everything we hide and we try very hard to hide it not even consciously unconsciously they're going to find it and when they find the afikaiman and they deliver it to mommy and tati what do you do some of us look at them and say who asked you don't you see it was under the couch keep it there keep it there you're bringing shame to the family it's your problem 
you need therapy. That's one thing you can say. Another thing you could say is you could take the Afikoyma and you could say thank you for bringing awareness to our family. Let me give you a prize. And only when you take that Afikoyma and you internalize it and you eat it and you look at it and you focus on it can you all say together as a family, L'shana haba, B'Yerushalayim. That's when we graduate from a place of exile and defensiveness to a place of redemption. That's when we go from a place of defensiveness which is always based on fear and trauma. I have to be defensive. Here's the rule. When your children share with you how horrible you were as a parent, your natural instinct is you ungrateful. You ungrateful, self-centered, lazy, ignorant, clueless, kofoy toiva, get out. But that's just my amygdala being triggered and trying to survive. You're more powerful than being defensive. You can actually listen. Whether it's right or wrong is a good discussion, an important discussion. But most importantly, you don't have to become defensive. You could really, really listen and tune in and create space for them to process their emotions. Children need to process their emotions and today, even 40 year olds still look to mommy and tati sometimes to process their emotions. You're lucky. You don't have to cut it down and tell them how wrong they are, how obnoxious they are, how good you were and how much sacrifice you had. That, tell your therapist. Tell your shviger, she'll agree with you. Can I really listen? It's hard for people to really, really listen. We become defensive. But when I become defensive, my child says to himself or herself, they're doing it again, there's nobody to talk to. Parents don't like hearing this. They have to be more grateful. Maybe. But the only way we can help people reach higher places is from within. When we let them process what they're feeling and experiencing it and then grow from a place of inner awareness by cutting you down, by, amp by trying to force you to amputate your heart and just do what I did. Really what she's saying to you is, mommy, you have a lot of trauma. So now you just want to continue it for the next generation? This is your MO, Tati. I get it. But let's try to create a paradigm shift. What if we don't have to be defensive? What if we could really listen? Maybe I'll learn, maybe I'll grow. Can you create space for it? One of the most powerful teachings I heard myself from the Lubavitcher Rebbe, I was 14 years old. I, don't, I can't tell you I understood it then, but I heard it, and I heard it very well. Until today, it comes back to me and I could still see it in my mind's eye. I could still see the Rebbe sitting, it was Shabbos Parshas, Vayeshev, Tovshin Memvav, 1985, the end of 85. I was a year after my bar mitzvah. And the Rebbe then quoted the Rashi in the beginning of Vayeshev. Bikesh, Yaakov, Leishev, Beshalv. Kofa Tzalov, Rugzoy Shal Yosef. Yaakov was already an old man. All he wanted was, he wanted to retire in Israel. Yeah? Sounds familiar? You buy a beautiful apartment. Leisha Bashalva. I already dealt. I dealt with Asav. I dealt with Lavon. I dealt with Asav again. I dealt with Shechem, Chamor, Dina. Tsaris, Mitsudis, Mitsudis, Mitsudis. It's time to settle down. Leisha Bashalva. Is that such a bad thing? He was over a hundred. I want a little serenity. What happened? The agony of Yosef being sold into slavery and disappearing for 22 years leaped upon Jacob. And Rashi continues from the Medrash, God says, Tzadikim, Reitzim leishe b'shalva b'olam haza, Tzadikim, they want serenity in this world. It's not enough what they have there in Olam Haba. And I still remember the Lubavitcher Rebbe asking the question, what is so bad? It almost sounds like that Yaakov was punished because he wanted tranquility. 
Is that really such a horrible thing? Is that such a terrible thing to say? I want a little calmness in my life. Kafat's a love. It's almost like a cruel, sadistic response. <laughs> you want to relax? Let's get schlafen. Let's get schlafen. Not on my watch. <laughs> Let me show you. I still have in my bag of tricks something that's going to rattle you and stir your kishkes. You thought Asaf was bad. You thought Lovon was a gangster. Let me show you what's going to happen. And indeed, what happens now to Yaakov is unfathomable. Thinking that Yosef is dead, and really he wasn't dead. Come on. <laughs> and what's wrong if you give him serenity? And what's wrong for asking serenity? And then the Rebbe said, but look in Rashi, he uses the word tzaddikim. Tzaddikim ask for serenity, and God says, it's not enough, Allah, but why are you calling them tzaddikim? If it's such a bad thing, to ask for serenity, why are they called tzaddikim? <laughs> so he says, that's the key. These are tzaddikim who ask for it. It's not a bad thing at all. Then he said something. I'm going to say it in my own words, the way I understood it. And I have to say, I still remember the emotions with which the Rebbe communicated this idea. He became very emotional. He was close. To, it was close. I felt like almost the Rebbe was, cry, was almost crying. But I'm not sure I understood it. I'm not sure I understood it. The Gemara says sometimes it takes 40 years to understand what your Rebbe said. Sometimes it takes four decades or three decades to understand something. You heard it, but you're not ready to understand it. And the Rebbe said, Bikesh Yaakov Leishev B'Shalv. Yaakov wanted serenity. Kafa Tzalav Rukzay Shal Yosef. The story of Yosef leaped at him. It wasn't a punishment because he asked for serenity. It wasn't even God defying his request. You want relaxation? <laughs> no way. You got the wrong world. You got the wrong God. It was a response to his request. Kafa Tzalav Rugzer Shal Yosef was the response. You want serenity? This is what happened. Because let's think about it. What did the family look like at that time? Externally, the family looked perfect. It's a beautiful family, right? Twelve boys around the table. Twelve girls around the table. Or daughters-in-law around the table. Everybody smiled at the bar mitzvah pictures. Everybody was like this. Everybody. At the chasenes, everybody was smiling. The mitzvah tans, it was unbelievable. The shatchanim were like, this is the perfect family. Unbelievable. Also the only Jewish family, but also the perfect family. At the surface, everything looked beautiful. But what was happening beneath the surface? Beneath the surface, this was a split family. Vayisnu Oisai. The brothers hated the Oisai. They couldn't speak to him. They were jealous of him. They wanted to kill him. They ended up throwing him in a pit, but the very notion that they wanted to kill him, they wanted to kill him, hide their footsteps, hide the evidence, throw him into one of the pits. Superficially, it looked great. Internally, there was so much pain. There was so many wounds. There was so much misunderstanding. Bikesh Yaakov Leishe Yaakov wants serenity. What does serenity mean? What does serenity mean? There's superficial serenity. There's serenity which I sometimes call serenity. Just leave me alone, numb my pain, let it look good. God says, you deserve real serenity. You need authentic serenity. And the only way authentic serenity can happen is if the infections come out and they're dealt with. Kofat salav rugzer shal yosef was not a defiance of Yaakov's request. It was allowing this family to go through the healing that it needed for 22 years. Those 22 years, everybody had to transform themselves. Yehuda who said, what money will there be in this kid staying in the pit? Let's sell him. The same Yehuda 22 years later 
says, Ki avdecha ora vesanar. I have guarantor, I became the guarantor. Yeshev na avdecha, I will be a slave and let Binyamin go free. Ki eich elel ovi vahanar enenu iti. How can I go up to my father without this young lad? V'nafshoi kshura b'nafshoi. That's when Yosef doesn't contain himself. And he says, And when Yaakov came down to Egypt and he lived his last 17 years in Egypt, 17, the Balaturim says, the Zoyer says, those were the 17 best years of his life. That was serenity. This was a healed family. This was a family that processed its pain, processed its emotions. Now, the foundation for a Jewish people can happen when brothers can trust each other, when sisters can trust each other. Now the nation would be able to survive for the next 3,000, three and a half thousand years. It's a different type of serenity. Sometimes we look at those children who shake up the family. They sometimes leave the cut and beaten track. They challenge their parents. They deprive you from your night and your day. They cause you sleepless lights. And you say, I have raised a beautiful family with sweat, blood, and tears. All I want is a little serenity. But the truth is that sometimes it's these children who actually allow us to become real people and real Jews. They allow us to transcend our egos to face our traumas, to look at our triggers, to see our insecurities, and to finally decide whether we serve God or we serve the Haredi social system. Whether we are social conformists, whether we are social conform, thank you. <laughs> These children challenge me, they challenge you to go into the Afikaiman, <laughs> to expose the Afikaiman and ask myself, what's really bothering me? What's really bothering me? My neighbors, my relatives, my in laws, my sister in law, my brother in law, uncles, aunts, shatchanim, seminary, schools, nachas. You were supposed to be a nachas machine. Hey, nachas machine, where are you? Why are you malfunctioning? Okay, let me take you to a therapist. Fix the nachas machine. How much is it? $300? Okay, no problem. Here's a credit card. Fix the nachas machine and send them back home when you're done. Yeah, we want to put them on a conveyor belt. Hatch them, match them, dispatch them. And you know what? If it works, God bless. <laughs> For some, it's amazing. But some of you were blessed with deep souls and sensitive souls. They don't like conveyor belts. They can deal with hypocrisy, especially if they're HSPs, highly sensitive people. They're orchids, they're not dandelions. Especially if there's been developmental trauma, never mind if there's been molestation or abuse, never mind if there was pain or dysfunction, never mind if there's things we know or we don't know, they may not even know and maybe even relegated to their subconscious. And we all have to grow up and stop asking what's wrong with you and instead start asking what happened to you. The question what's wrong with you is one of the most unfair questions. Give me your hand, give me your heart, and let's find out together what happened to you, not what's wrong with you. And in this processing of emotions, what we're seeing today, and mothers and fathers ask me every day, where is all this trauma coming from? Where is it all coming from? Who created it? And the answer is, my dear friends, Noyach, also was at the end of 10 generations. Avramovin was at the end of 10 generations, but it was a big difference. Noyach kept to himself. Avramovin who changed his generation. And when you heal a generation, you don't only heal that generation. You heal retroactively all previous generations. Today we know with epigenetics that in our genes we carry the traumas that we 
experience. They used to think trauma is just an event that happens to you. No, trauma goes into my genes. So I may have in my genes the trauma of my father, my grandfather, my great-grandfather, maybe 2,000 years ago. Your child may be carrying in his or her genes, or your student or your disciple or your friend may be carrying in their genes, your experiences, your parents' experiences, your great-grandparents' experiences, who knows how back. And it's coming out. And you know what happens? A generation is given the opportunity to heal retroactively all the previous generations. Because when you're talking about Geula, two things have to happen. Number one, we have to become fully present in the relationship with all of our emotions, but something else happens. We become the Tikkun retroactively for all of Jewish history. That was Avram Avinu's uniqueness. The Kibel Schar Kulam. He fixed everybody. When my trauma emerges in its full pain, and instead of running away, I can make space for it, and I can be an empathetic witness, it's not only me I heal. I heal retroactively all the souls that are not here anymore. But they carry it, and they hold on to it. That's who our children are healing. That's who our youth are healing. We need awe. We need reverence. We need respect. And we need a lot, a lot of empathy for ourselves and for others. And here's the word, here's the rule. You could never have empathy for others if you don't have empathy for yourself. There's no way I could create space for your pain if I don't create space for my pain. Because if I don't create space for my pain and you share with me your pain, all I'm doing is I'm naturally triggered to do with your pain what I do with my pain, which is numbing or suppressing or repressing. So when my children or my students are triggering me badly, what's the avoid? The avoid is be curious. Look at what's happening inside of you. Watch what's happening in your heart. Watch what's happening in your soul. Watch what's happening in your nervous system. Create space for it, and then you'll be able to create space for that person. This is deep work. This is what the Baal Shem Tov said, before you rebuke somebody else, there's one more person you have to challenge. It's yourself. If I'm ever rebuking you from a place of anger and impulsive toxicity, I'm not talking to you. I'm trying to deal with my own inner chaos. If I'm not regulated, if I'm not self-regulated, if I am in survival mode, coping mode, I'm an alligator. I'm in my reptilian brain, so I'm a reptile. How do you expect a reptile to educate a child? Explain that to me. You sometimes watch a parent or a teacher talking to a child, and basically I'm watching it, the child is seven, and the teacher is two. He went into his reptilian brain, so he's in survival mode. The child is seven, and that's why the child sounds much more intelligent. I don't blame him. He's two. He's seven. If I'm not self-regulated, if I can't go from my reptile and reptilian brain to my mammalian brain to my prefrontal cortex, how in the world am I supposed to communicate to this student or to this child from a place of expansive consciousness? from a place of caring and empathy. I'm just trying to cope. I'm, cho I'm literally choking. And that's why in the Tanya, the biggest focus is you have to know which soul is talking when. The Balatanya, the Alter Rebbe says, you have a Nefesh HaChiyunis, a Nefesh HaBahamis, a Nefesh HaSichlis, and a Nefesh HaLekis. We used to believe the Alter Rebbe when he wrote this in 1790, 1780, that he probably knew what he was talking about. But in 1980, we got the CAT scans. And suddenly when you look at the CAT scans, you see the Tanya in the pictures. The brain has literally layers. It evolves. There's your amygdala, the stem of your brain, the reptilian brain, it's nefesh achionis. It's just trying to live. It relegates your breathing, it relegates your temperature, it makes sure you're surviving. All the systems that you desperately need biologically to live, just like a crocodile or a lizard. And then there is Nefesh Bahamas. They call it the mammalian brain. That's the elephant inside of me. 
or the chimpanzee. Depends on the day. Sometimes the mouse. Sometimes the rat. It's for the men's section. <laughs> it's the chimpanzee. Very emotional. Elephants are emotional. They're mammals. It's called Nefesh Bahamas. It's my little puppy or my German shepherd that is very emotional, my limbic brain, Nefesh Bahamas. It's not bad. It's just an animal. It's just an animal that's trying to live and survive. Then you have Nefesh HaSichlis. It's a rational consciousness. Prefrontal lobes, prefrontal cortex, allows for executive thinking, allows for long-term vision, allows for weighing the pros and the cons, delaying gratification, seeing the bigger picture, morality. And then you have that which doesn't show up on the CAT scans <laughs> because you can't take a picture of it. It's the Nefesh Eloi kiss. You can't take a picture of it because it doesn't have a picture. It's divine. It's transcendent. It doesn't have an image. It's a piece of divinity. It's a derivative of the consciousness of infinity. You can't take a picture on a CAT scan of infinity. But that's the Nefesh kiss. If I'm in my survival mode, there's no way I can tune into my divine consciousness. I can't even tune into my rational consciousness. This is the process that people need to be aware of in this generation pre geula when we want to develop that type of relationship that is not based on fear, but based on real attachment, based on real connection. And every one of those ch children and that youth in your classroom or in your house or in your neighborhood who rattles the community and rattles the family, it's giving us a gift to achieve real serenity. Real relationships, real authenticity, a Yiddish guy that's not based on superficiality, social conformity, hypocrisy, suppression, repression, falsehood, lies, covering up criminals, tolerating injustice, just to make sure that our system is perfect. It's like the Jew who had diabetes and he had gout. Gout is painful. And he was in the hospital, the same room with a Gentile. The Gentile also had gout. The doctor came in and he turns to the Gentile and he says, no, show me the foot that has the problem. Shows him the foot and the doctor starts touching it. He starts hollering. The doctor starts poking. He's a good doctor. He's poking and he's screaming. You never heard somebody scream like this. For half an hour, I shite. The doctor goes to the Jew. He says, no, show me the foot. The Jew shows him his right leg. He starts poking and hacking and drilling and poking and needles and mice. And the Jew is quiet. The Gentile looks at him after the doctor leaves. He says, I have never seen a man with so much self-control. How did you do it? He says, you think I'm stupid? I showed him the healthy leg. <laughs> think I'm a shaita? <laughs> Where do you have the chachma? You show him the, 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 the leg with the gout? You don't do that. I feel sometimes that we have become a community where we only like to show the healthy leg. We don't have another leg. That's how the Magid interprets the, 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 the man who came to Hamai and Hill. He said, teach me the whole Torah on one leg. So the Magid says he didn't want that his mood should fluctuate. He didn't want the roller coaster of life. He always wanted stability, consistency. Doesn't work that way. A healthy community could be self reflective. If Torah is true, we don't have to cover anything up. We don't have to cover up the molesters among us, and the abusers among us, and the stupidity among us, and the lack of awareness, and the cluelessness. And we don't have to cover up our own mistakes. If you're connected to truth, you could be vulnerable. We all did the best with the tools that we had, and now comes the age of healing. And the age of healing means we can talk vulnerably and honestly with authenticity and tenderness and compassion and love about our limitations, about what we tried to do and what we did, about the fact that some of us had our brains shut down at the age of six, and we are in survival mode, yes. And we didn't know any better. I would say most divorces that I see happening today 
are not because couples are not compatible. It's because one of them or both of them are living in active trauma. And when you're in active trauma, you simply are not functioning as a human being. You can't. If a tiger right now comes into the great synagogue, right now, and comes near me at the stender, and all of you stand up and run, and I say, hey, relax. I'm talking to you. No! And I say, okay, well, let's meditate. We're going to meditate. Close your eyes. Feel the support. Feel the support of the ground. Feel your bench. Feel sensations in your body. And let's breathe. And let's voo. And let's expand the vagus nerve. And let's get from the amygdala to prefrontal. And you're like, Rabbi, why, why? Good luck. I'm out. And I'm like, why, why is this crowd so round? Like, why can't you all relax? The answer is because there's a tiger in the room. That's what active trauma means. Your wife is talking to you about Pesach plans. There's a tiger in the room. You either freeze, you fight, or flight, or fawn. You can't function. There's nobody there. And there's a reason there's a tiger in the room. Probably at age three or four or five or six or seven, whatever happened, that part of the brain shut down. And when it's triggered, when these situations are triggered, it just you go into that space. If I'm not aware of this, how can I begin even to heal? This awareness is painful. But that's the gift of our generation. All the all the issues are coming out. You know why? Because God says it's time for redemption. It's time for intimacy. You can't have intimacy when your heart and brain are offline. Intimacy is oneness. Dveikus. I can't have intimacy if I'm not here. If I'm not alive. If I'm not passionate. If I'm not on fire. But if my whole life I'm defensive, I'm just coping. It's a coping mechanism. There's no intimacy. At best, there is survival. So I may be religious because I'm trying to survive. And religion fits into survival. There's no ecstasy. That's not Gaula. That's what we're seeing. And it's a gift. It's an opportunity. And we are forever going to be thankful to the young people who are challenging us in this way. Every one of them, every family now has somebody challenging them. The only families I know that are still perfect are the families I don't know. Every family is being challenged one way or another. And we want to just like throw them into therapy, send him back when he's normal. Bikesh Yaakov Leisha Bashalva. You're trying to cope. I get it. I get it. We need a support system. You need to feel the pain. But there's an opportunity here for real transformation, for real growth. And that's going to create relationships that are of a completely different caliber, completely different age. And they're not only healing our generation, they're healing retroactively our parents and our grandparents. Like Avram Avinu, Kibel Schar Kulam, because the generation at the end of Golos needs to heal all the generations from Adam. That's why the kids are struggling so much. They're not only dealing with my stuff and your stuff, they're dealing with thousands of years of stuff. It's coming out. It's all coming out. We go crazy. Like, what's happening? What, what, we were so bad. You're much better than a lot of people that preceded you. But the truth is, they're carrying within them so much depth of hundreds of generations. And Avram Avinu, the paradigm of love, says, come, let's embrace not what happened, not what's wrong with you, but what happened to you. And then we can go and heal and heal all that, all those genes, all those sensitivities. And all of history experiences a tikkun. When things are coming up for you and you want to run away, you want to go into survival mode, remember, if you could stay present with your pain and stay present with your children's pain, with your students' pain, with your grandchildren's pain, you're not only healing you, and you're not only healing that child, you're healing all of history. Kibel schar kulam. When I was a child, 
the night of Pesach, the Lubavitcher Rebbe used to give matzah. He would distribute matzah to uh, people who helped out in his home or his secretariat. And my father was one of the people who would get matzah the night of Pesach. So I went along with him for many years. The Rebbe had a custom to the adults, he would give a whole matzah. To the children, he always gave a broken matzah, a piece of, a bro a piece of matzah. Now, it's never a problem to find a broken matzah because you're lucky even to find a whole matzah. You know what I mean? So he was always, there was broken pieces. He would give it to the children. So every year when I went before Bar Mitzvah, he would give my father a whole matzah and he would give me one of the pieces of broken matzah. This is the first night of Pesach after Mayrev before the Seder. I remember one year I went in and it came my turn. I was standing in front of the Lubavitcher Rebbe by his room. His face was glowing like a Malach It was the first night of Pesach. You could see the energy, the Kedusha of Pesach, of his Mancher Huseinu on his holy face. I'll never forget. I was a kid. And the Rebbe was standing by the door of his room. He had his kapote, his gartel, his hat, and he had a whole thing, a whole uh, pile of matzah covered in brown paper. And he opened the paper. And guess what? It was all whole matzah. Usually on top, you have a lot of broken pieces. So he started to lift it up. He lifted up the first matzah to look for the broken piece. No broken piece. He lifted the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, and there was no broken piece of matzah. He went all the way down till the bottom, and I don't know how, but every matzah was completely whole. And I still remember the Rebbe took both of his hands, he took the pile, and he turned it over, <laughs> and he started to do it again. I guess he thought maybe, you know, there was somewhere hidden over there, right? The and it's hidden over there. So he turned it over, literally, and started again from the opposite direction because he turned it over. And he went down again, and there was no broken matzah. I'm standing there, and what am I thinking? I'm thinking, Lubavitcher Rebbe, you don't tell, I won't tell. <laughs> Nothing will happen if you give me a whole matzah. Don't worry, I'm not going to go down to 770. I make an announcement to 10,000 people. Hey, I'll just go home with my... What's wrong? I'll get a whole matzah. Like, is it such a tragedy? If I get a whole matzah, even though I'm not by mitzvah? I'm, I'm thinking this. I didn't say any of this. But he finished a second time, and I could see, as much as I could see, that the Rebbe was, like, reflecting, pondering what to do. And... Uh, I saw like, like he started, he was thinking whether to break, to break a matzah, but somehow he didn't want to break a matzah. He just didn't want to. So he walked away to go find a new pile of matzah, a whole new pile of matzah, which he would have to untie and open up and bring back. So he started to walk away, and I could see the Rebbe was like, it looked like he was thinking, and then he walked back, and he took a matzah and he broke it. He broke the matzah. And he gave me the broken piece, and he looked me in the eyes, and he said, And I took the matzah, and I went on. I knew the story, I was there, but I never reflected on the story. I was a little kid, you know. I got the broken matzah, the Rebbe broke it in front of my eyes, and that was it. As years progressed, and I went around the block a few times, and I had to deal with some of my own traumas and struggles. And I traveled the world and I met a lot of very special souls and a lot of broken souls. I reflected, the story came back to me. And I asked myself, why did the Rebbe not want to give me a whole matzah? And I saw he didn't want to break it, but he broke it. And he broke it in front of me and he gave it to me. I don't know the answer, but I could speculate. And perhaps the speculation has some truth to it. And that is, I feel that the Lubavitcher Rebbe was giving me or intimating a very subtle message. And that is, don't be afraid of broken places. And don't be afraid of broken souls. And don't be afraid of confronting broken situations. Often, it's very easy to be afraid. It's afra easy to be afraid of my own brokenness. It's, afraid. it's easy to be afraid of other people's brokenness. Who wants to see brokenness? We like to see wholeness. But there's going to be a generation 
where people are going to be confronted with a lot of brokenness. And we could do one of two things. We can either say, get your life together, you loser. It's just your imagination. Come on, get over it, you spoiled brat. We could do that. But what's really happening is, it's our own. It's our own brokenness that cannot deal with somebody else's brokenness. So I have to become defensive, I have to become aggressive. Or we could do something much deeper. We can really, really create space for our own brokenness and space for other people's brokenness. And I think that night empowered me in a very powerful way. That whenever I read an email or I hear a story or I meet somebody and people share a lot of broken stories, Lots of broken stories. I get around 200 emails a day, and it's not an exaggeration. And people usually don't write to me, Rabbi YY, I won the lottery, and I wanted to give you 50%. That's not what a typical email looks like. A typical email looks like, right, when I was seven years old. Now I'm 72. Wow. But I still know what happened when I was seven years old. That's how it begins. I'm not going to tell you how it ends. You'll figure it out. And I meet these people. And I remember that moment with the Rebbe when he looked me in the eyes and he broke the matzah. And he said, Because if you could look somebody in the eyes and become an empathetic witness for their pain, you can also become a catalyst for their healing. Where you can really, really create space for people's emotions. Something magical happens. We don't realize how magical it is. We often think empathy is just a cute, nice little thing. The Alter Rebbe writes in Lakuta Torah, the most important attribute in Avodah Hashem is Midas Harachamim. Empathy. Empathy is magical. Because when I become a womb, a Rechem, the word Rachamim comes from the word Rechem, which is a womb. A womb doesn't judge. A womb just contains. When I could become a spiritual womb, like mothers are physical wombs, an empathetic witness for your journey, but with real, real empathy. I have to suspend my triggers. I have to suspend my ego. I have to suspend my fear. I have to suspend my defensiveness. I have to suspend my insecurity. I have to suspend my toxicity. And guess what? I have to stop justifying myself. I have to stop telling you how righteous I was. I have to stop telling you how I tried so hard. I have to stop telling you how I'm a martyr. I have to stop telling you that I'm God's gift to humanity. I have to stop telling you that you're a brat. I have to stop telling you that you could kick yourself into shape if you wouldn't be such a victim. I have to stop philosophizing, rationalizing, justifying, operating with my cerebral brain to suppress all pain. I have to stop all of that. That's hard. If you're a Jew and you have a Yiddish cup and this is what you've been doing your whole life <laughs> and suddenly I have to go to a different place and I can emote, I can experience that and I can even shed a tear with you and hold your hand and say, let's take a walk together to find out not what's wrong with you but what happened to you, what happened to me. Souls have the power to heal. The power is within. The power is deep. The power is profound. And when I can actually be there with you in your pain, where nothing has to be hidden anymore, the afikaiman could come out, your soul will know exactly what to do in order to find the light of God there. Because it's always there. It's always present. You know, still... It's hard. The journey is hard. And it's why I always found that in our generation, it's fascinating. I landed yesterday, 5 o'clock. My first speech was shortly after. From Pikesh Yaakov Leisha Vashalva, but that didn't happen. So, <clears throat> I went to Binyanei Haoma. Like 60,000 Jews came to celebrate Yutas Kislev. And... I was there till like five in the morning 
There were 2,000 people, 3,000 people there till 4, 4 in the morning. I finally ran out, got to the hotel at 4.30. And I was thinking to myself, you know, I don't know if in the last 200, the, the Alter Rebbe came out of prison 224 years ago, in 1798. When he came out of prison, it was in Petersburg. It was an island in Petersburg, like Alcatraz. They put the greatest criminals there because the prison is surrounded by a river on all sides, so you can't run away. I was there. You could see it. I was there when I was in Petersburg a few years ago because this was a place for capital crimes, treason. And Alter Rebbe was accused of treason. He wanted to overthrow officially Powell I. <coughs> when he came out of prison on Yutas Kislev, you know, if I was a fly on the wall and I was watching it, what would I think? I would think, okay, I feel good for this rabbi. But how important is this day? I mean, Tsarist Russia was in its full might. And here was a fine Hasidic rabbi who can go home. Okay, very nice. Two centuries pass. And where is Tsarist Russia? It's in Wikipedia. And where is communist Russia? In Wikipedia. And where is present Russia? Of Tzadis. Thanks to Putin. But this year, Yutas Kislev, I think more classes, Fabrengen's events happen in the whole world and in Israel probably more than in the last 224 years. In Russia itself, last night and tonight, there are more than 400 in Russia. Russia and Ukraine, those who stayed in Ukraine, more than 400 gatherings, Fabrengen's classes, Shiurim events in honor of Yutas Kislev, and that's talking about Russia itself. The question is, what happened? Why is that happening? The answer is because the Jewish people, as the Gemara says in Psachim, page 66, the Jewish people, they may not be prophets, but they're children of prophets. In other words, the Jewish immune system is very powerful. Jews feel, they feel things. The Jewish collective consciousness has divine inspiration. And the Jewish people feel, and they know, that the teachings of the Baal Shem Tov, the teachings of the Balatanya of the Alter Rebbe and their students are the oxygen for our generations. And I use the term oxygen because what does oxygen do? Oxygen is not luxury. <laughs> oxygen is literally, it allows you to live. It allows you to thrive. It allows you to function. Because in a generation like ours, when people are processing so much and there is so much anxiety, and there is so much stress, and there is disappointment, and there is uncertainty. On one level, there is prosperity, and there are miracles, and there are incredible blessings. And on another level, there's a lot of stress, and exhaustion, and anxiety, and mental illness, and trauma emerging. It's like a paradox. I have found in my life, and I believe it's true in the lives of so many who have tasted and internalized the light of the Baal Shem Tov and the Alter Rebbe, the light of Chassidus, that the oxygen, the inspiration it gives in this time is incredibly powerful. Why? Because number one, it always taught and always understood and always communicated the truth. And that is that there's never a situation where your internal core can be damaged. One of the key teachings of the Baal Shem Tov and the Alter Rebbe is despite anything that happened in your life, even if I have been in coping mode for 50 years straight, the core of my soul is a chelek eleikami mal mamish, it's divine and therefore it's infinite and therefore it's indestructible and therefore its power is absolute and non-negotiable and therefore all the confidence and all the charm and all the creativity and all the curiosity and all the love and all the joy and all the optimism that this soul essentially has could never be obliterated and eliminated even if I had no access to it for so many years because my core was an exile in Gullus. That conviction, that awareness, that knowledge about yourself and about your loved ones is incredibly powerful. But its teachings, the Chesed of the Baal Shem Tev and the Alter Rebbe go one step further and say it's not just your core is powerful. It's even deeper than that. They take you one step further and they say, 
even all your negative emotions are searching for healing and correction and tikkun. There's an amazing teaching of the Maggot of Mizrich, again, whose yard site is today. And the Maggot says, listen, open your hearts. Yosef is in the house of Potiphar. The wife of Potiphar is trying to seduce him. One day he comes home and there's nobody home and this is her opportunity and she says, lay with me. And the Talmud quotes the opinion that Yosef surrendered. He couldn't hold back anymore. And what happened the last moment? He saw an image of Yaakov, his father, in the window. And when he saw that image, he ran out. He fled. And the Maggot of Mizrich says, what did he see? He didn't know what Yaakov looked like. What does it mean? He saw the image of Yaakov, his father, in the window, and that was it. Listen to what the Maggot says. He says as follows. Petifra's wife was beautiful. She was charming. She was creative. She was appealing. She was exciting. The Gemara says that she changed her uniform three times a day. She changed her outfit. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner in order to impress Yosef. I imagine the credit card bill of Potiphar. Three times a day, a new outfit, every day of the week. It's like in the Pesach hotels. It's a lot of anxiety, you know? I tell my wife, my packing is simple. Black, 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 white. You don't like it, don't look at me. There was something very powerful about her. And Yosef was touched. He was drawn to her. Says the Magid, what stopped him? He saw the image of Yaakov, his father. It says in Zohar that Yaakov is the embodiment of Midas Hatiferes. Yaakov embodied the divine attribute of beauty. When Yosef looked at Potiphar's wife, suddenly he saw the image of Yaakov, his father. Says the Magad, this was a psychological process. Yosef asked himself, what am I really looking for? She's a married woman. What am I really looking for? You could just tell yourself your emotions are bad. You're a horrible person. You have a crush and you're not supposed to have a crush. You're evil. You're going to burn. That's the gullus way of doing it. The gaula way of doing it is you're looking for something. You're searching for something. Potiphar's wife represents something that you need. What is it? And Yosef had an answer. Tiferes. There's a beauty. There's a harmony that I'm searching for. There's a wholeness that I need. And then Yosef says, but one second, the source of Tiferes is Yaakov Avinu. So why should I go and use a much lower base level of Tiferes, which is not even mine, which is going to create and wreak havoc and destruction when I can go back to the source and get real beauty, which will actually fill my soul because it's not an addiction. It's something that I can actually make mine. He ran away, not because he ran away from Potiphar's wife, because he actually understood what he wanted with Potiphar's wife. And he went to the source. He identified the source, Midas Atiferis. In simple English, it may mean, sometimes if I don't have a father, I search for relationships to fill the void. Dr. Tversky once told me, Dr. Tversky, Olav Shalom once told me, he says, Rabbi, why, why? Let me tell you something. I have 60 years of experience. He told this to me in Boca. 60 years of experience has taught me that the addicts among us are the most spiritual among us. And they couldn't numb their pain with Rogalach and Jalapeno Herring and Yerushalmi Kugel, like some of us. So they went to alcohol, to drugs. They destroyed themselves. You know why? Because their void was deeper, because their spirituality was deeper. I, I eat babka and I'm done, I'm good. I feel bored, babka. More bored, another babka. More bored, okay, some shwama. That's why I look so good. <laughs> the addicts among us, Dr. Tversky said, doesn't work for them. The Kiddush Club doesn't work, the Rogalach doesn't work, even the cheesecake doesn't work. Imagine. Hard for me to imagine. But, yeah. The spiritual souls among us. 
they actually need God. <laughs> they need God. And if they don't have God, they go to other extremes. And every day they need more and more and more and more. But really what they need is they need a father. They need a mother. Yosef realized that. He said, I don't need Petifer's wife. I need my father. And I can have my father. Because he had a father. He had a father. He didn't have to go to her. So what the Magad is teaching us is, instead of telling yourself how bad you are, can you really identify how good you are? But perhaps my wounds are searching to fill their void, and therefore they have evolved to become toxic, negative. This is a much deeper way. That's why the Tanya says, you could transform your animal soul. You don't have to kill your animal soul. Transform it. How do you transform your animal soul? Because when my animal soul gets angry at my spouse or my children, when I get jealous, when I get vengeful, when I get hateful, when I get resentful, when I get mishuga, when I get anxious, instead of condemning myself and telling me why, why you're evil, can I accept the broken matzah and say, wow. What are you looking for? What is this anger protecting you from? What is this anger protecting you from? I have to say, I was very impressed with Dick Schwartz's No Bad Parts, IFS, because I started to read his model of healing, and he has this word. He says, your core is in exile, and then you have a bunch of protectors and firefighters. And it's like the whole Tanya says the soul is in Golos. And then you have Klippa. What's Klippa? Klippa is a protector. So we look at a protector and we say, you're bad. al says, you're not bad. It's an animal trying to survive. When you get angry at your spouse, it's telling you something. There's something happening. There's pain. Can I ask what I am looking for? The same is true when you have a crush. The same is true when you're looking for, when you're addicted to this website or that website. The same is true when you're addicted to one thing. You're looking for something very beautiful. But all you have is the wife of Potiphar because she always makes herself available. You know that. That's her thing. She has an unlimited credit card. She's good. Yosef had the vision to say, wait, wait, wait. There's something much deeper here. And then you sublimate. It. And then there's the third teaching of the Baal Shem Tev and the Balatanya that becomes oxygen for our generation. And that is, you weren't sent into this darkness and into this trauma by mistake. God was with you all the time holding your hand because there's something that you have to bring out from that darkness. We're in Yerushalayim. So I want to conclude with a Jerusalem story. I love this story. It's so meaningful. It tells us how much we don't know. There was once a wedding. And who was at the wedding? The Alter Rebbe. And they had a batchen. You know what a batchen is? A batchen is a joke, like a gesture. But who's going to make jokes in front of the Alter Rebbe? Not an easy task. So you know what he did? He drank. He drank a lot. So he could open up. So he turns to the Alter Rebbe. And he says, Rebbe, after a lot of thought, I decided there's no difference between you and me. Between you and I. Why? He says, whatever I know, you also know. Whatever, okay, whatever... Whatever I know, you know. Whatever you don't know, I also don't know. So what's the difference? There's a couple of things you know and I don't know. But he says, but how does that compare to what you don't know? And the Alter Rebbe started to cry. How does what you know compare to that which you don't know, which is infinite? He started to cry. That's what, that was his batchanas when he was tipsy. The humility that we don't know is so important. Why was this soul sent down this corridor of darkness? I don't know. And when I say the words I don't know, I choose them carefully because Esther was valedictorian of Beis Yaakov, Yerushalayim and B'nai Brak. 
She was also valedictorian of Beis Chana, Benoist Tzion, Beis Ruchel, Beis Rivka, Bruria Shulamit, and Evei Tu, and Chemdas, and all the other seminaries and schools. The Shadchanim were coming after her like there's no tomorrow. Esther was Krem, Dala Krem, Dala Krem. The best family in Iran. It was Jewish. It was very Jewish then. And then who took her at the end? A drunkard, alcoholic, Persian Meshuganim monarch by the name of Achashverish. And Mordechai at some point says, Esther Ke, mi oideya, im leis kazoi sigat lamalchus. Who knows if this is not the reason you went down that place, you're going to save the Jewish people. And he says, mi oideya. It's not something that I can understand or figure out with my cerebral brain. There's some things beyond Das. And that's why, how do we celebrate Purim? Adeloyada. The journeys of life, you will not process through a cerebral mathematical process. The journeys of life you embrace with humility, with faith, with openness, and with appreciation of the infinity of life's journeys and mysteries. So there's a Jew... He's 94 years old or 95 years old today. He lives in Petach Tikva. And his name is Rabbi Yaakov Frank. And he shared the story. I heard him tell the story. Rabbi Yaakov Frank was born in August 1929. His grandfather, Rabbi Tzvi Pesach Frank, was the chief rabbi of Jerusalem after Rabbi Cook passed away in 1935. Reb Tzvi Pesach Frank became the great, great Rav of Yerushalayim for many decades. He was a great Talmud Chacham. He was a brilliant scholar, but his heart equaled and matched his mind. He was a, a loving, humble, beautiful person. Reb Tzvi Pesach Frank, known as the Har Tzvi, very special man. He lived not far from him. Reb Tzvi Pesach Frank had a grandson who was born in Chaydish of after Tisha B'Av, Tafresh Pei 1929. His bris was the next Shabbos. Reb Tzvi Pesach Frank had to be that Shabbos in Hebron for a Sheva Brachis of his family. But because his son had a baby, his daughter-in-law had a baby, and he would be the Sandik at the bris, so he stayed back in Jerusalem. That Shabbos was the Hebron massacre 60, 17th of Av, 18th of Av, 69, 69 Jews were axed to death by the Arab terrorists. Reb Tzvi Pesach Frank and his wife were both saved because they stayed behind in Yerushalayim for the bris of this boy who would be named Yaakov Frank, who lives in Petach Tikva today, La Riches Yom Davis. 94 years old, 1929, 94. 24 of the Jews murdered were students of Yeshiva's Hevron, Slabotka. Reb Nossin Svi Finkel came in the 1920s from Lithuania and built a Yeshiva in Hevron. Knesset Yisrael, Hevron, Slabotka, Yeshiva. 24 of the Jews murdered were Yeshiva students, young boys, who were killed. One of them, a few of them were American. One of them was an American boy. And in America in the 20s, there were no yeshivas. Tari Vadas would open a little later. Yeshiva University would open then. But there was no infrastructure of yeshivas. And he was a brilliant young man and he wanted to learn. So he asked his parents if he can go to Israel, Palestine. And they agreed. And he went to learn in Hebron. <coughs> he was from Philadelphia. And he did amazingly well. In 1929, things got very, very chaotic here. There were riots and the parents were worried for their son. So they sent a telegram to the Rosh Hashiva. <coughs> Excuse me. And they asked if their son could come back. They want him back. <coughs> Rabbi 
the Rosh Hashiva asked Reb Tzvi Pesach Frank to intervene. And he said, since you have connections with communities in America, because everyone used to ask him questions in, in writing, do you know the rabbi of that shul in Philadelphia? Reb Pesach Frank said, yeah. So he said, could you write him a letter and tell him that in Hebron everything is safe? Because one of the leaders of Hebron was Rebbe Leozer Dan Slonim. He was on the council of Hebron. He was a banker. He spoke Arabic. He was very close with the Arabs. So the Jews of Hebron felt protected. In fact, when the pogrom started, they all went to his house. He had a gun. They davened there. And then somebody took away his gun and he was murdered. His wife was murdered. And all the Jews in his house were murdered during Shachris. But Hebron is safe. Because the Rosh Hashiva said, Rabbi Shemar the Rosh Hashiva said, to lose this boy, going back to America, we're going to lose him. And he's a budding diamond. He's a budding leader. He's charismatic and creative and wise. And we need, we need these types of leaders. So Rabbi Pesach Frank acquiesced and he sent a message to the rabbi in Philadelphia. Please tell the parents, Hebron is safe. They shouldn't take their boy home. And they listened. And the boy stayed in Hebron and he was murdered. And Rabbi Tzvi Pesach Frank could not forgive himself. He felt that literally he mixed in and he was indirectly guilty. The parents were worried. They wanted to bring this boy home. He convinced them not to bring him home and the boy was murdered. Which means he felt he had blood on his hands. It was indirectly obviously and it was non-deliberate but he felt ultimately why did he mix in when he did not know the situation and why did he give such advice? And he could not forgive himself. Now, he wouldn't talk a lot about it, but his grandson, Yaakov, whom because of his bris, Reb Tzvi Pesach was saved, with him he shared the story. He said, you know, I was saved because of your bris, and this boy, I caused his murder. And he could never, ever forgive himself. Years passed. Reb Yaakov Frank told the story. It's 1960. That's 30 years. The massacre was 29. So this is 31 years after the Hebron pogrom. And he's in Miluyim. He goes to the IDF. He's already 30 years old, 31 years old. And he's a reservist in the IDF, 1960. And they're in training. They're doing imunim. And one night, it was a Wednesday night, they were somewhere in a field doing training, and it started to pour. And they went into the trenches, but the water was so powerful, the downpour was so intense that the trenches filled up with water. And they were there for hours soaking. And in the trench that he went in, there was another man, also a reservist, who went into the same trench. So now they're both soaked. The floods are coming down. They're drenched to the core of their bones. They're freezing. But they're there in the middle of the night in some place. So you start talking to each other. Shalom Aleichem, what's your name? Your name? Yaakov Frank. Yaakov Frank, grandson of Rabsi Pesach, you know Jewish geography, the great Kabbalist Jackie Mason. He's the guy who repeated my jokes. So Jackie Mason once said, if two Jews meet and within three minutes they don't establish a family connection, one of them is not Jewish. <laughs> so he says, uh, Yaakov Frank, yeah, you're the grandson of Rabsi Pesach Frank. He says, yeah. So he says to him, Wow, how is your grandfather doing? He's great. And they're talking, what do you do? He says, I'm a historian of the Yishuv HaYehudi Be'eretz Yisrael Lifnei Kum HaMedina. I'm a historian of the Yishuv in Israel before the state was established in 48. So he starts talking about the Hebron pogrom and how he saved his grandfather because he was a sandik at his bris. And then he tells him, you know, but my grandfather is still broken hearted because of that Slabotke Hebron boy who was murdered. So this historian looks at him, they're in the trenches. And he says, do you know the end of the story? He says, what end of the story? The boy was dead. The boy was killed. What's the end of the story? He says, you know, there's another part to the story. He says, I never knew. So he says, well, this father, the father of the boy who was slain was a big macher in Philadelphia. He was a diplomat and he was very close to many politicians in the State Department. And he made a ruckus. He went to the State Department and he says, it's the British who are guilty. Because how did they stop the Hebron pogrom? The British came and they shot. And the rioters left because the rioters didn't have live ammunition. They used knives. They used, they used hatchets. They used axes. And when the British started to shoot, they all ran away. Why couldn't the British shoot early Shabbos morning? Why couldn't they shoot Friday night? 
They let it happen. They were accomplices to the murder of these Jews. And he made such a commotion in the State Department, they put pressure on the British, and they replaced the commander of the British presence, the British mandate, the one in charge, and they sent a military man by the name of Arthur Wakoff. He was sent by the British to replace the leader of the British, uh, the British authority mandate here in Palestine, Arthur Wakoff. And the man says to Yaakov Frank, Arthur Wakoff started to travel the land. Thank you. And when he started to, when he started to travel the land, he fell in love with Israel. He fell in love with them. And he liked, he liked the Jewish people. And he came here in 1931, and his tenure continued to 1937. And during his tenure, he opened up the gates, and he allowed anyone who wanted to immigrate to Israel. And because of that, close to 400,000 Jews could come here. In fact, because of him, he says, when Hitler rose to power in Germany in 1933, many German Jews and Austrian Jews could come here, and many other Jews from Eastern Europe made Aliyah because he opened the doors, and not only that, he quadrupled the ability of Jews to own territory, to own assets, to own ground and earth in Israel, almost five times the amount, and he almost quadrupled the number of Jews living in Israel. When he came here, there were around 150,000 Jews. And then when he was done in 1937, he was gone officially because of an illness. Some say he was fired, whatever it is. The number was much, much higher. And he looks at Yaakov Frank. He says, I just want you to realize one thing. In 1948, during the independence war, there were 600,000 Jews here. 1% of them were killed. 6,000 Jews were killed in the War of Independence. But if not for Arthur Wakov, there wouldn't have been 600,000 Jews. There would have been much, much, much less. And there was no way, naturally, they could win any war. So just realize that despite the horrible, horrible tragedy, that story caused Arthur Wakov to come to Israel. And because of that, today, today they can build a country of Israel and... 200,000 Jews were saved from Auschwitz because they could come here during those years. So we don't know why that boy was killed, but we should just realize that the whole Israel and hundreds of thousands of Jews owe their life to that boy because of what happened. Yaakov Frank was stunned. It's 1960. He said, my grandfather never heard the end of the story. Nobody ever told this to him. Nobody knew it. I have to tell this to him. He says, go ahead. At that point, it was three in the morning, and the commander said, listen, this training is not going anywhere because this rain is not stopping. You can all go home. <laughs> you have an early chafesh, sof shavua, go home. And they're drenched. They say, baruch shepatrani, they go home. He comes home. <clears throat> he was exhausted, he was tired. He tells his wife, Yaakov tells his wife, they had a baby, he tells his wife, Ani no seya miyad saba. I'm going right away to Saba, to Reb Tzvi Pesach Frank. She says, you go visit him every Shabbos. Every Shabbos after davening, he walked an hour and a half to go visit his grandfather. He says, no, I have to go now. I said, what do you have to go? I have to tell him something. She says, go. He comes Thursday to his grandfather. Reb Tzvi Pesach Frank greets him and says, I thought you were in Sahal. What happened? So he tells him the story. They were soaked and the commander said they can go home and I wanted to come here. He says, why do you have to come here? You're coming Shabbos anyway. He said, I have to tell you something. He says, what do you want to tell me? Before you tell me, first a cup of tea. He puts up the kettle. He gives himself and his grandson a cup of tea. He says, Yaakov, to saper. And he tells his, his grandfather the whole story of what he just heard in the trenches about the consequences of the death of that boy and how it changed history in Israel. So Pesach listens, and he says, wow, I never knew this. Literally, you just took a stone that was on my chest for 31 years, and you removed it. And he said, you know, I'll never forgive myself for what I did, but I realized that there's things I just don't know. And stories have continuations in ways that people don't know. And he thanks him, and he walks him to the door, and he says, I want to tell you something. You didn't have to bother 
and leave your wife and child when you're anyway coming for Shabbos. You didn't have to. But I will never be able to thank you enough for the fact that you rushed right over here and you told the rest of the story. And he escorted him out, he gave him a kiss, and he said shalom and he left. Shabbos morning, this was his custom every Shabbos morning, Yaakov Frank finished davening, and then he walked an hour and a half to go to visit his Saba and say Shabbat Shalom. On the way, he passed his brother-in-law's house. His brother-in-law comes out and says, you don't have to go. He says, why not? He says, Saba passed away. Shabbos, 8 o'clock in the morning. It was Shabbos told us, Chaf Aleph Kislev. Chaf Aleph Kislev. Tov Shin Chaf Aleph. December 1960. Reb Tzvi Pesach Frank passed away suddenly at the age of 87. This week is his yard site. And he just passed away two hours ago. There's nowhere to go. Yaakov Frank was stunned. The next day was the funeral. Mitzvah Shabbos was the funeral. 1977. There's a mahapecha. There's a revolution in the Israeli government. For the first time, it goes from the left to the right. And Menachem Begin becomes the prime minister of Israel. Some of you may even remember it. Till then, Israel belonged to the left. Menachem Begin, who was always in the opposition, became the prime minister of Israel. Who did he hire? And one of his people was Yaakov Frank. And he was in charge of helping build the territories in Yehuda and Shamron. Menachem Begin sent him to the United States of America to do some work on this behalf of the Jews living in those areas and building up the Shtachim. And in the process, he told him to go visit the Lubavitcher Rebbe. So in 1977, Yaakov Frank came to visit the Lubavitcher Rebbe in Brooklyn. He went in, he introduced himself. The Rebbe asked him, of course, the Jewish question, are you related to Rebbe Tzvi Pesach Frank? And he said, I'm his grandfather. And he said, the Rebbe looked at him and said, Tisaperli al Saba. Tell me stories about your grandfather. So he told the Lubavitcher Rebbe about his grandfather. And the Rebbe says, Otsipur, tell me another story. Tell him another story. Otsipur. Kept on asking him for more stories. And finally he said, and tell me one more story. <laughs> so he decided to tell this story. And he told this story. The Rebbe listened. And when he finished, the Rebbe looked at him and he said, I want to tell you something. I always tell my students, and I always tell anybody who listens to me, that when you have an opportunity to do something good, don't delay it. Because miman of shach, any way you look at it, it doesn't make sense to delay it. If it's something that's not worth doing, then you shouldn't do it even in six months. And if it's something that's worthwhile doing, then do it today. Don't do it tomorrow. Don't do it in two hours. Do it now and do it today. And he says, look, if you would have waited for Shabbos to tell your grandfather this story, you would have never forgiven yourself. You would have never forgiven yourself. And your grandfather would go to the next world with this heaviness. Because you had the conviction. Mitzvah baleyot ch'altach mitzen, azrizes, vayashkem avram baboyker. To go now and go right now. So look what happened. Your grandfather died that Shabbos morning a day later with a sense of peace. And you had that sense of peace. How grateful you are to yourself for doing that. He said, look at this lesson. When there's something good to do, do it now. As Rabbi Yaakov shared this story, I thought to myself, here you see the words of Mordechai, Mi yodea, adala yada. Who understands people's journeys? Who understands where souls have to end up? When you look at yourself or you look at different souls, especially the souls of your loved ones, and you see that they're on journeys, sometimes very complicated ones and very difficult ones and very painful ones, it's very easy to go into a place of guilt and shame and self-loathing and negativity and toxicity and blame this one and blame that one. But we really have to have the humility and the awareness that we don't know, we don't know and understand journeys, we don't know mysteries. What we do know is every soul has its mission, its shlichus. Mi idea. And if I can embrace that and realize that the places I ended up in and the places I went to and even the mistakes I made and things that happened to me were not random. They weren't just tragic 
tragic stories that created so many complications. But rather, like Yosef, they were opportunities for unbelievable growth, even if it came with pain, because there's something that happened as a result. There's something you took out from that experience. There's something you have because of that that the world needs. There is a light that God wanted you to retrieve from the darkness, and it's why he took you down that path. And the world needs that light today. This, then, is what the Baal Shem Tev and the Balatanya taught. Never see yourself only as a victim, because remember these three things. Number one, the soul could never be damaged, ever. It's as infinite and as bright as eternity itself. Number two, even the challenges and negativity I'm dealing with are husks, they're shells, they're protectors. Like Yosef, be curious, and you will see that your crushes, your addictions, your anger, your garbage, your complicated stuff, not only should you not be ashamed of them, but with tenderness and compassion, ask them what they need. Ask them what they're looking for, so you can heal your animal consciousness, so you could heal your reptilian brain, so you could bring God into all the parts of yourself, so you could bring oneness into all the parts of yourself, so you could bring in consciousness into all the parts of yourself. And number three, remember that even in those moments of darkness, you were never alone. God was with you, holding your hand. Gam ki begeit and like Yosef, remember that in life sometimes you feel like you were buried. And you have good proof for it. People have been throwing lots of sand and earth over you. And Yosef was the first one who knew what it felt like because he was thrown into a pit not once, but twice. Once by his brothers and the other one, the other time by Potiphar's wife. What was his secret? His secret is he realized he was not buried. He was planted. When you plant a seed, technically you bury it. But you're not burying it, it's planted. And suddenly a few years later, The problem is, In order for seeds to blossom, you need water. Joseph's pit didn't have water, but it had a different type of water. The Torah says, Jacob didn't stop crying. His father's tears... The tears that represented the fact that I believe in this boy and I don't believe he's dead and I will not stop thinking about him because he's not dead, he's alive. Those tears irrigated the cistern, the pit where Joseph was buried so that he could be planted. In fact, it says so clearly in Telem, Hazoirim Bedima. Who was planted with tears? You know anybody that was planted with tears? Yes, Yosef. Berino Yiktsayu. The man who was carrying the sheaves, who dreamed about the sheaves bowing down to him, ultimately became the man who gave those sheaves to the whole world and sustained them in the famine and sustained his own family. Where did these sheaves grow from? They grew from the tears of a father who would not stop believing in his child, of a father who would not become disconnected from his child, of a father who always knew the power of his child and believed in his child so that the child could believe in himself. Those tears, with Joseph's confidence that God was with him, allowed him to transform burial into plantation. And the pit became a wellspring of growth, of awareness that transformed civilization. The word Yosef means growth. And hence, it's why the teachings of the Baal Shem Tev and the Alter Rebbe, which highlight these ideas again and again and again, can oxygenate a generation and allow people to switch on the light in yourself that not only represses darkness, but sublimates and transforms darkness as a preparation for the complete oneness 
a oneness that means we can show up to life and relationships and Yiddishkeit with our full hearts and our full souls and our full passion as the oneness is revealed in the world. Hashem Echad Ushmoy Echad. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. This class is brought to you by the yeshiva.net. Please help us continue the classes. Make even a small contribution at www.theyeshiva.net slash donate.